Do you really need prenatal genetic screening? Today, we're going to cover all of the reasons why you may or may not want to consider non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT. If you're new, my name's Jess. I'm a certified nurse midwife and infertility mom. I'm currently 13 weeks pregnant after a frozen embryo transfer, and I just had my first appointment with my OBGYN this past week. Like many expectant moms, at the end of the first trimester, I was offered non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT. So what is NIPT? NIPT is blood work that can be offered to pregnant women as early as 10 weeks of pregnancy to screen for chromosomal abnormalities. It's called non-invasive because it's not invasive to the baby, but it does require a blood draw from the mother. These tests are also sometimes referred to as cell-free fetal DNA screening because they're actually taking DNA out of the mother's blood that belongs to the baby that is not within a cell. These tests primarily screen for three things. Trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. Trisomy 13, also known as Patau syndrome. 80% of babies with trisomy 13 will not survive the first month of life, and only 10% will survive the first year of life because of the multitude of genetic abnormalities associated with the condition. These anomalies can include things like abdominal wall defects, spinal cord defects, or microcephaly, which is small head size. Number three, this test also screens for trisomy 18, also known as Edwards syndrome. 90 to 95% of babies with trisomy 18 will not survive the first year, and most of them won't survive more than a few days, again, because of the significant physical anomalies associated with the condition. I have seen NIPT pick up other chromosomal abnormalities. For example, I had a patient whose baby had chromosome 15Q deletion syndrome, meaning that part of her 15th chromosome was missing, and the test did catch that even though it wasn't specifically screening for that. Because these tests are looking at your baby's chromosomes, they can also tell you the baby's sex chromosomes. In addition to telling you if you're expecting a boy or a girl, they can also screen for the following sex chromosome anomalies. Turner syndrome, also known as monosomy X, so a female with only one X chromosome. This is definitely one of the most common chromosomal anomalies. I've seen it at least four times in the last two years. Triple X syndrome, or 47XXX, meaning females with an extra X chromosome. I've never actually seen this one in practice. Kleinfelter syndrome, which is 47XXY, so a male with an extra X chromosome. I've only seen this one once in seven years. And Jacob syndrome, which is 47XYY, so a male with an extra Y chromosome. I've also only seen this one once in seven years. The majority of babies are going to have 46XX or 46XY chromosomes. I find that most patients want to find out the sex of their baby as early as possible, like a lot of patients want to plan a gender reveal, but it's important to keep in mind that if you do NIPT, it is a package deal. It is a medical screening test, so if the information I just listed is not something that you would want to know, you may want to consider an over-the-counter test like sneak peek. This is still a very accurate test that will only tell you the sex of your baby, and I'll drop a link for it in the description. Even if you want to know all of the information possible, sometimes I do have to disclose the sex of the baby when I'm reviewing results with patients. So for example, I recently had a patient whose NIPT results were inconclusive, but suspicious for monosomy X, so when I reviewed the results with her, I had to tell her that she was expecting a girl and it couldn't be a surprise for later. Because these tests are able to identify fetal DNA, they are extremely accurate. So for some conditions, they're as much as 99.9% accurate. That being said, it is still just a screening test. So if you have an abnormal result, your provider may recommend an amniocentesis to confirm that result. This is a more complicated test that involves getting a sample of amniotic fluid from around the baby by placing a large needle through the mother's abdomen. This test has to be done inpatient, so in the hospital, and it does carry a small risk of miscarriage. You don't have to do an amniocentesis if you have an abnormal NIPT result, but it is going to be the quickest way to confirm your results. I have had some patients wait until their 20-week ultrasound to look for any abnormalities. So for example, I had a patient last year whose NIPT screening was positive for Down syndrome, but she was not comfortable with doing an amniocentesis. So instead she did an early anatomy ultrasound at like 12 to 13 weeks, and they did see some markers for Down syndrome. And then at her 20-week ultrasound, they were able to identify more markers for Down syndrome, like an absent nasal bone. And so then she knew even though she didn't have the amniocentesis to confirm that her baby had Down syndrome, the screening test was probably accurate. So who should get non-invasive prenatal testing? I find patients are pretty divided on it. About 60% of patients feel really strongly about having it done, and about 40% of patients feel really strongly about not having it done. These are the things that I encourage my patients to think about when it comes to non-invasive prenatal testing. If you found out that your baby was probably not going to survive past birth, would you want to carry to term? If your baby has Down syndrome, would you want to know ahead of time so you can prepare, 
Or would you rather not stress about it during your pregnancy and figure it out once the baby's born? Are you over 35 and therefore have a higher risk of a chromosomal abnormality? Do you have a history of miscarriages and would you prefer to have an answer in case something happens? I've had a couple of patients get NIPT, miscarry, and then get their results back to learn that their baby had monosomy X, so then they at least know why they miscarried. Because of my miscarriage history, I did opt to do NIPT when I was pregnant with my daughter just because I wanted all of the possible reassurance I could get that she was healthy. Since we did IVF for this pregnancy, I'm not going to spend money on NIPT this time because we already did pre-implantation genetic testing, and I know that we transferred a euploid or chromosomally normal embryo. I had the option of finding out the sex ahead of time. In fact, I could have even chosen the sex this time, but because it was so much fun waiting to learn if my daughter was a boy or a girl during my last pregnancy, we wanted to recreate that magic, so we're waiting to find out until the baby is born. It's worth noting that a lot of insurances will not cover NIPT if you are under the age of 35, but most companies will have a cash pay option in the $100 to $250 range. You can call the company that your provider uses to check their policy, and you can also call your insurance to check for coverage. NIPT is completely optional. It's obviously not for everyone. But I think there's this misconception that if you have an abnormal result that you have to terminate your pregnancy, and that's certainly not true. Because it's a screening test and not a diagnostic test, there is additional testing you would want to complete before making the decision to end a pregnancy. And you don't have to complete any of that testing if you don't want to. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have questions about NIPT that I didn't answer, please drop them in the comments. I post new videos every week about infertility, pregnancy, and my own IVF journey, so make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss an upload. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.